Welcome to the Bonhoeffer Show with Bill Hall. The show about stuff most people try to avoid, but can't because it controls their lives, religion, culture, and politics. Why does Bill Hall host this show? Because he and Bonhoeffer hoisted a few brews together in Berlin. Ah, uh, nope, that never happened. Is it that Bonhoeffer's book, The Cost of Discipleship, both challenged and changed Bill as a young man? Well, yes, that is part of it. But it's primarily because Bonhoeffer called us to a costly discipleship. And there has never been a time when such courage has been more absent or desperately needed than now. Bonhoeffer famously said, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. The Bonhoeffer Project is committed to turning leaders into disciple makers. Because if leaders fail to create disciple making movements, then we have failed. So, ladies and gentlemen, here he is. He's still tall and good looking. And yes, he is wearing German cologne. He's acquired a few more underlying conditions. But direct from his underground bunker in Long Beach, California, the man who once told Don Henley, you can check out any time you want, but you can never leave, Bill Hall. Well, thank you, Steve Simmons, the man with the golden pipes. Ladies and gentlemen, today our subject is what Jesus never taught. Now, this is a little bit dicey because I've often said on this program, we can't pretend that we live in this bubble and that current events or things that are happening in our culture are divorced somehow from our actual lives and that in the church we should act like, oh, all this stuff that goes on around us is not really going on. And we just need to study the Bible and pray and smile a lot and make disciples that are really good church members and we'll win the world. And I've been making the point now for over a year, no, that we won't. Uh, as uh, Malik said uh, many years ago, Charles Malik, he said, if you think you've won the soul, but you haven't won the mind, you really haven't won the soul. Yesterday was a bad day for America. It was the day in which people convinced that something had been taken from them, the election. These people stormed the US Capitol building. And I have to say that as a 70 plus American citizen, uh, I cried. It was a very painful thing to watch that actually this was happening in our country. And it was happening with people that probably were, at first when I saw them walking through the Capitol, what I saw on camera was, well, there's a bunch of just normal people walking through the Capitol. And they're not destroying anything. They're not hurting anyone. They're, but. Uh, and so it was kind of hard to see at first. And then later on, of course, as the films came out, uh, as uh, the tear gas came out, as uh, them trying to break into the uh, house chamber, uh, as all these things happened, and of course, one woman tragically was shot and killed. When all that was happening, um, I, I was appalled by what I saw, like most Americans. And so emotionally, I was involved. Emotionally, I was impacted. But at the same time, at the same time, I began thinking. And, you know, you have to think as well as feel and feel as well as think. And what I heard or what I saw was that, first of all, I made this connection that President Trump had gone too far, that legally he had certain avenues open to him, but at some point, the rule of law must be the rule of law. And we are a country that keeps us, the order and the chaos, those two things, the order is the rule of law. And when you 
go beyond that to gratify your own somehow unmet emotional needs, which I've said for many years that I thought that even though I agreed with many of the policies of Donald Trump, that I thought that he was suspended in a, a perpetual state of adolescence. And it started to come out, the darker angels within him, and the things he was saying were, in, you know, I have to say, were inciting people. And these people didn't look particularly dangerous. Most of them probably on a normal day would be normal kinds of people, but essentially it was the mob rule. And you know, one of the things about mob rule is that people default their own conscious state uh, beliefs and their own personal responsibility for their actions and defer it to the leader of the crowd. And this is one of the things that people have studied mobs and groups and, and uh, people that storm the Bastille or they, uh, they attack. This is kind of the behavior of this kind of group. And so that's what got out of hand yesterday. Now, gratefully, at the end of the day, uh, the rule of law was established, reestablished, and the Congress did their work. And I commend them for that. But I think that uh, President Trump is persona non grata now. And uh, for whatever he wanted to do, it's certainly backfired on him. Now, the thing that really I started thinking, though, is that what do we as Christians do at this point? What is it that we say? And I knew that this was going to give cover to, uh, you know, this was pretty much is going to fall upon the heads of Republicans. And so the Democrats will have now cover, air cover, so to speak, uh, to do whatever they want. Now, that's, that's a political game. Uh, we, in this program, don't want to really get down too deep in the weeds politically. But essentially, uh, the thing that I really want is consistency. And so the people who condemned what happened yesterday, I'd like to see them condemn what happened all summer. And the looting and the rioting, when they would say it's mostly peaceful, but there were a few people acting out. All right? And uh, that wasn't being condemned by the Democrats, not until... It, the polls started showing that they were uh, losing votes because of it. And then only then toward the end did they come out. So what I really would like to do is to see both parties in our country, if you wanna bring peace, if you wanna bring some sort of agreement and working together and bipartisanship, everybody's gonna to have to own their own problems and their own result of their ideologies. And unless there is something meeting at that level, uh, this is the cleavage will get only deeper. So essentially, uh, what I was thinking is that Christians right now, the response of many Christians will be, well, let's just, we're exhausted, we're tired of this, you know, we we don't want to do this anymore. We don't want to engage in any conflict. So let's just go to back to our churches and pray that God will do something. And uh, But we're just going to go back and pray and, be, and smile a lot and be nice. And I don't think this is what Jesus taught us. And that's our subject. And C.S. Lewis put it so well back in the 1940s when he wrote these words, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, referring to Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him, 
as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So Jesus said some really interesting things, and especially in light of yesterday, and this is where we have to walk a tightrope, isn't it? Because I'm not going to conflate Jesus and Donald Trump, okay? That's just laying that out there. Make sure you don't think that I'm somehow comparing them or in any way contrasting them in this case, because I'm not. But what Jesus was really, Jesus in Luke chapter 12 said some really interesting things. He said, do you think I have come to bring peace on the earth? No, I have come to divide people against each other. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, essentially, there's two things going on in our country. One is the democratic philosophy and the Republican philosophy and the deep cleavage between these two parties politically and the way America has been divided. But there's another issue going on here. And that is when the secular worldview collides with a biblical worldview. And that's the war that we're in. Uh, some people call it the culture war, but it is definitely a struggle that we Christians are in. And what we see is, especially with some of the strange things people are proposing these days, and some of the really sea changes morally in our culture is what is going on is there's this conflict between biblical Christian faith and what we might call the secular viewpoint or the progressive viewpoint. And so this is what this is the battle that we're told to engage in. And so the day we're going to be talking about how we can engage in this battle, because we are a nation divided. We're divided politically, but we're also divided morally and ethically and biblically. Uh, there's all these divisions going on. It's, it's a complex issue because politic, politicians and politics is a reflection of the culture. And the culture is a reflection and built upon worldview. And that worldview, you know, basically, when I say what my worldview is, it's this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's my starting point. All right? So if you start there, there's some very logical things that are in alignment with that. Now, as we look at this today, uh, I would say Jesus never taught his disciples should retreat from conflict. Uh, and because things that are in front of you, you have to deal with. They should not, you know, there's some people who actually do believe and, and they, they, might, they, are, they want us to retreat and say, don't dirty yourself with these human battles and these things that people talk about every day that you hear, read about in the newspapers or you see on television uh, that are not directly religious. But Jesus didn't teach them to retire from cultural or political battles that they would find themselves in because they preach the gospel and preaching the gospel. All you got to do is preach the gospel and tell the truth. It's really hard to tell the truth. It's really going to be hard to tell the truth right now. And when you tell the truth, you're going to collide with the values of the world. It's inevitable. And so I say that the conventional advice in the church right now is we all need to calm down. We need to back off. We need to bring about peace and unity and revival to this country. And of course, those are great sentiments. That's, that's what we want. However, the way you get there is a little different. You know, the way you bring peace on the earth sometimes is through war. And some of the great heroes of America, some of the greatest peacemakers we've ever had were uh, General Dwight David Eisenhower, who was also president, or George Patton, or uh, Douglas MacArthur, or Matthew Ridgway, or Norman Schwarzkopf, or uh, any of these people who were generals. Uh, 
people who were profane, like with Patton, he was, I just finished an 800 page book on George Patton. He was temperamental, he was grandiose, uh, but people like them, sometimes they are needed to do the dirty work. And then we cast them aside afterwards. But uh, right now, cutting to the chase, after Jesus offered the olive branch to Israel through his sacrifice on the cross, he was rejected by his own and his ways by much of the world. In the final analysis, the Prince of Peace, and this is the thing we don't like to talk about in polite company, is he will use violence to bring peace to the earth. The Prince of Peace comes back on a white stallion with King of Kings and Lord of Lords upon his thighs, and he slays the armies of the world with the sword, which is the word of God from his mouth. And that image over against the Prince of Peace is something that's kind of confusing to people. But what Jesus is teaching us is that in order to bring about peace, you have to deal with evil. And so the question I think is relevant to us as Christians is how are we going to deal with evil? How are we going to wrestle with this issue? What is going to be our response? Because listen, um, if we just try to get along with people and we capitulate with things that we don't really believe to be true, but we just don't want to be in conflict, and we just appease the culture, you know what's going to happen? It's going to get worse. And something is at stake. Uh, and what is at stake is the eternal souls of people. Now, if we don't believe that, I think we should sell our buildings, our church buildings, Divide up the money and have a nice day. If we're not playing with real bullets and real, with real ammunition in real situations, then we should quit pretending that we are. So, in just a moment, I have two guest hosts this week. I remember when uh, Mike Douglas, now you really have to be old to remember Michael Douglas. I won't ask Cindy if she remembers it because I know she does. But Michael Douglas, remember he had John and Yoko, you know, John Lennon and Yoko, whatever Yoko's last name. Did Yoko have a last name? Uh, oh, no. Oh, no. Yoko Ogino. <laughs> I've forgotten that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and uh, he had guest hosts, you know, for this week, guest hosts. So this, uh, for the next few programs, we have guest hosts. Uh, which is uh, Cindy Perkins, and I'll introduce her a little bit more in a second, and then uh, Jim Thomas. So let's take a break and hear what, uh, how you can get involved with the Bonhoeffer Project, because you know we turn leaders into disciple makers, and that's really what we need to do. That's really the action of the church, the only thing that we've been authorized to do. So let's listen to what Steve has to say. We turn leaders into disciple makers. That's the mission of the Bonhoeffer Project. But before we can turn you into a disciple making leader, we need you to be in a cohort. A cohort is a one year, 10 meeting, book reading, praying, wrestling, writing, planning challenge that has the potential to change you and thus redirect your life. Interested? Here's the process. Go to our website, thebonhoefferproject.com, and complete the application form. We will contact you. We will then help you select the type of cohort that's best for you. In person, online, or online school, which is asynchronous, so it's not affected by time zones and anyone in the world can access it. Oh, and training is now also available in Spanish. In the meantime, Subscribe to the show, read one of Bill's books, and send us a question you want Bill or some member of the Bonhoeffer team to answer. And now, back to the show. All right, so now today we have two guest hosts, 
The first is Cindy Perkins. Cindy Perkins is the executive director of the Bonhoeffer Project. Uh, she is a woman of many talents, uh, has a graduate degree uh, in, uh, what is it, your, your graduate degree in? Organizational leadership. Organization, how perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Organizational leadership and uh, is one of the best leaders I know. Uh, all that other stuff will come out later, all her other resume. I don't have time, you know, it's like 20 pages long. So I'm not gonna go through all that. Might be with well. us. <laughs> and then uh, JT or Jim Thomas. Uh, Jim Thomas is Dr. Jim Thomas, PhD, pilot highly and deeper, right? That's right, that's exactly yeah. right. He is pastor of uh, First Baptist Church in Fayetteville, Georgia, not to be confused with other Fayettevilles around the country, and uh, the home of Chick-fil-A. Amen. Yeah. The man likes his chicken. All right. So uh, Jim is one of our, he's our director of training. He also uh, is one of our cohort leaders and uh, a member of our national leadership team. So two of our very, very best and brightest with us today. All right, so now I've had my moment in the sun, so to speak. Uh, let's, let's hear from the two of you just kind of responses, and then we'll go on from there, and we'll start with you, Cindy. Okay. So I think um, as I listen, I also yesterday was heartbroken. Um, in, in my lifetime, I... I I'm a strong American and I've traveled into places in the world and, and I understand that what we uh, experienced yesterday, many others in the world have experienced uh, much of their lives. And so I was heartbroken uh, and at the same time grateful to God that we live in a country where within the same 24 hour period, we were able to reestablish rule of law in that place. But I, I really began to think about and was thinking even this morning, um, ab about the whole situation. And, and I believe that some of the responsibility for this lands back in the church, because I think as a Western church and the church in North America, we have neglected to be strong about the sovereignty of God, about, we talk a lot about the love of God, but we leave out the fact that God is a just God. And so I think um, we, we have some responsibility. This really is a discipleship issue. It really is a discipleship issue. I was listening to the prayer that happened in Congress, and I'm like, we have a pastor of a mainline denomination who can't let God be God. He had to add all the other things onto the prayer. And, and again, heartbroken that the church is not necessarily doing what the church needs to do in that place. And, and it comes down to the point where we, as leaders within the church and um, within organizations, because it doesn't matter if your organization is secular or uh, sacred, it, you are still the sacred in the sacred space with God. And for us to remember that our God is sovereign, right? That he is a powerful God. We must keep doing what he told us to do. And you're, you're saying that it's going to be difficult for us to tell the truth. Um, it's going to be difficult for us to tell the truth and be liked. Right? Yes. Uh, as, as, it is, it is the, the motivation seems to be, it seems like evangelical motivation seems to be, you know, if we're just nicer to people, if uh, then they'll like us. And if we appease them, they'll, and then they'll like Jesus. Yeah. And I think that's a false construct. Definitely a false construct. And, and when I think about this, I think that all of our responses, right? Because, because we all have thoughts and feelings and ideas in our minds and our responses could come across as harsh and hard, just like everybody around us. But our responses are where we have to be kind. We have to be exuding the love of Jesus out of our pores. That has to be so deeply ingrained in us that when 
we respond to somebody, we're responding to them out of the love for them as a human being created in the image of God. And if they don't know God, to remember that this is the most important thing that we can bring to them. And so our responses have to reflect that, but they can't be watered. That's what the problem is now is, is Christianity in America. And we, we talk about this a lot in the Bonhoeffer Project, but Christianity in America, this Western gospel has watered it down where we don't really um, engage the sovereignty. We don't really think about and talk about the power and authority that were given by the Holy Spirit of God. I've taken a deep dive into the book of Acts this season. And, and uh, what we're experiencing is just a fraction of what the Christians in the early church experienced and they kept going. Well, uh, uh, JT, if you were uh, in that crowd yesterday, let's say you were a Trump supporter and you were there at the rally and there were probably, uh, I don't know how many thousands of people, there were quite a few people there. I'm not sure what the count was, but um, when people started running up the hill into the Capitol building, what, what do you think you would have done? That's a great question. Um, my propensity is to avoid that type of conflict. So, uh, <laughs> To be there to make a statement, to speak into culture, uh, would probably be my uh, prerogative there. But but to charge something like that would just not be who I am, and probably try to convince people not to do that. That would have been, and of course that puts you right in the middle of the fray, right? But isn't that what Christ in culture is all about? If we truly speak truth into the culture, then we're going to be in the middle of the fray. And I, I love the, one of the opening quotes you used from Malik, the, the idea that we don't win the soul until we win the mind. And that really does go back to the idea of what disciple making is all about, doesn't it? It's about helping people think differently. Uh, you know, new life in Christ, as Paul would say, that we're new creations is learning to think and live differently in the power of the spirit and because of what Christ has done. And therefore, when we begin to th learn to think biblically, to think Christianly, as N.T. Wright would put it, then I think trying to convince people to actually act that way becomes how transformation begins in people's lives. And we, again, as Cindy said, or Yoko, sorry, said uh, a second <laughs> ago, uh, you know, that's part of the process of how the Holy Spirit changes people. And we deal with that in the Bonhoeffer Project. And it starts with the mind. Dallas Willard spoke to that, this, this repentance, this change of mind that leads to a change of of desires and will and when that starts to happen in our lives and our actions look different don't you think that this crowd was um a lot most of it, you know 90 percent of it you know they we we say you know they said all summer long uh this is a mostly peaceful protest but there are people you know driving cars over people there are people uh looting and burning down buildings and all those things and that would be the minority of them mostly the Antifa and the BLM people, uh, as far as the organization is concerned. All right, so couldn't the same thing be said about this other group that maybe 90% of them didn't charge up the hill, that 10% did, something like that? I mean, would that be a fair estimate? I think that would be something, I think that would be fair, yeah. And as I start to identify some of these people, we start to see that many of them are simply professional protesters. They go from one protest to the next, to the next, to the next. And even one I was reading about today that was very identifiable at the rally in the Capitol today is between jobs and, um, you know, that whole thing where there's nothing else to do. So I'm just going to go do this. And um, and so, yeah, I do think that there are instigators, catalysts toward negative behavior in every one of those crowds. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I. Uh Another part of this discussion, I suppose, is uh, we talk about uh, this issue of um, perception and uh, the kind of disciples we make. And we've been talking about this. And recently, there's been a rash of Christian celebrities who have crashed and burned, uh, starting with Jerry Falwell Jr., at Liberty University, uh, several pastors around the country, 
uh, the last couple of years. You know, we've had the Willow Creek situation. We've had the uh, the big church in Arlington Heights, uh, Illinois. I can't remember the name of the church right now. Um, James McDonald, I think, is the pastor there. Uh, that was a slightly different issue. Uh, we've had in the last couple of weeks a major pastor of the Hillsong Church in the East Coast in New York. Uh, and, and then, so this issue of celebrity, the issue that, that Christianity, we haven't really set ourselves apart, that we've suffered from some, many of the same maladies as just general culture, that you can't separate us because we're no really, our conduct is not any better. So what is the solution to the, do we stop making Christian celebrities? You know, it seems to me that's sort of like saying men shouldn't look at women, you know, uh, that uh, it's a ridiculous idea. So is there any way we, is there any way to stop the celebrity culture that creates these perceptual problems and then uh, gives, continues to perpetuate this issue uh, or misconception of what Christians are really like? And uh, Cindy, what about you? What do you think of that? Well, I don't, I don't think we can stop making Christian celebrities. I, I think the idea of a Christian celebrity is, is a really tough idea. Uh, because if, as Christians, we're doing what we're supposed to do, we're pointing everybody back to Jesus, right? So there's there doesn't leave that room for that space. But men and women are going to seek after and and search after what they can see. And our nature, our human nature, uh, sans Christ, is to make idols out of people who don't need to be idols. But I think one of the one of the big pieces that has to happen is when a man or woman finds themselves going into this place where they're receiving adulation and and praise from people they have to look first at um why am i receiving this right um and what do i need to do about that am i pushing them toward Christ rather than toward me. I don't, I don't need that, want that, because that puts a whole different place when you get on the pedestal. When you fall, it's a bigger fall, right? But the other part of that comes down to the fact that we who are in leadership should be in discipleship relationships, in, in those accountable relationships where we don't allow ourselves to get to that place, right? Where they're, I mean, the, the people that I read about, once you reach a certain point of celebrity status, you can now push people away from you to the point where nobody has the right to speak into your life the truth. And the rules it don't apply to you anymore. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Right. And you so, get a hall pass. Yeah. And so I think if we if we had a different way of treating celebrities, I'm all for if you if you've got great talent, you've got great talent. Right. And and you're not going to push that away because God has given that to you, especially if you've got great talent in speaking and and all the things that our society finds useful and valuable but put some controls around yourself because we are all flesh still right uh what do you know about this uh, uh jt in the sense that you have a phd in leadership so uh you think about these kinds of things what is it that uh what do you think uh with what cindy has said about the celebrity culture, you know, the what we call the green room syndrome. You go to a church and they got a green room. Right. And I'm not sure why it's green, but someone told me once, but I can't remember now. Yeah, ours, ours is khaki. Uh, I don't Here's know a why. khaki or tacky. It's a khaki yeah. room. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I, you know, I, I agree with you. And I think that that the idea here stems around the intent. First of all, we have to design or, excuse me, define what a Christian celebrity is. Is that something that the leader is intending to be? And if that is, then that's fostered from a gospel that's probably errant. Um, if the end is your celebrity, then that starts in the wrong place. If the other, another definition would be that uh, you have influence. And as a result of that, there's a crowd that has been built around you and they are conferring that idea of celebrity on you. 
then that becomes a very diff- that becomes a very uh, dangerous place as well. I was listening to a, a podcast with the late Eugene Peterson actually earlier this morning, and one of the things he said about pastors and ministers is that we all have a sense of wanting to be important. Uh, there's there's a sense in us of maybe in my vernacular we want to matter, right? Um, and yet that can either lead to humility or it can lead to something a little more nefarious there. I know John Foreman, lead singer for Switchfoot, the band Switchfoot, once said this. He said that the stage is a bloated place. In other words, the stage is a place where it's not reality. It's a place where our egos get blown up, especially if people are complimentary to us. And we have to manage that. And in fact, if we don't manage that, the stage becomes our identity as leaders. And then if we don't do well, then all of a sudden we can become depressive. I've had friends in ministry that have committed suicide as a result of not feeling like they performed well. And of course, there were other issues going on as well. But the idea, I think, of Christian celebrity is just a symptom of something deeper. I think really the issue is pride, power, and our definition of success. And so when those things start to drive us toward um, what the world says success is, big numbers, big money, big fame, uh, designer clothes, and, and, and in many of those things, those things can happen in a healthy way. But when those things, that catalyst comes together of all of those different things, and we start believing our own press, then I think we, we get into a very dangerous place where, like y'all just said, that we start to think that we're invincible. And it's at yeah. that point that the enemy attacks and we fall. I remember one time Eugene Peterson was talking about how he went to a conference and he said it was antithetical to everything he believed. And he said at the conference, he was there for four days and it just sucked all the Jesus out of him. <laughs> and he went home and he had to spend three days reading uh, Karl Barth's dogmatics, Christian dogmatics yeah. to get yeah. back on track, which, uh, I've tried dogmatics and it was a real snooze fest. So right. I'm not exactly sure, you know, he was a different kind of guy, but with a different kind well, of sensibility. And I've been to a conference where the guy on stage said, Hey, one day you could be up here too. That's right. Yeah. You know, to a bunch of pastors. And I'm like, but is that the goal? Is that the end? <laughs> what if I never make it? Am I not good enough? Am I not worthy in the kingdom? You know, does Jesus not love me as much as he loves you or doesn't want to use me? I just think there are some false paradigms out there that are driven by a false understanding of the gospel and, and the purpose of the kingdom of God in the world. And it leads us to these type of tragedies in the end, if you will. Okay. Now, one other subject I'd like to talk about before we take a break, another break, and that is uh, the whole idea of uh, 60 minutes the other week night. I didn't last Sunday night, I did not watch this program. So I want to just full disclosure, but I thought that, the title and what they promoted was interesting. Can big tech stop hate speech? And, and I was thinking, well, they've tried, but it depends on what they mean by hate. And, and uh, I think it really is sort of basically anything that goes against what we call woke culture. And they want us to not believe our lying eyes. And uh, I got in trouble in a church once, and I'll probably get in trouble for telling this story. But I remember I was speaking about lies that the culture wants us to believe. And they're going to punish us and cancel us until we believe them. And that was uh, Caitlyn Jenner at that time was on the front of Vanity Fair or one of these big magazines. I can't remember which one. It could have been Rolling Stone. And... Uh, you know, I'm, I've been around a while, and I remember Bruce Jenner, Olympic champion on the front of a Wheaties box, the world's greatest athlete in the 1976 Olympics in Montreal. And so I said, when I see Bruce, when I see Caitlyn Jenner, what do I see? I see Bruce Jenner with a dress on and makeup. And even in the church I was speaking at, this was in a sermon in a church, and in between services, I was uh, accosted by uh, numerous people talking about why would I hate on somebody like that. I wasn't hating on somebody like that. I'm just saying that's what I saw. It was my own lived experience. <laughs> and uh, so 
both of you are active in local churches. Um, and so what is this woke culture doing uh, to your congregations and what kind of impacts are, is it having on the congregation and what are you, what do you think can be done? So uh, Cindy, how about you? Well, I think I think the woke culture um, says basically, if you don't believe what I believe, you're less than, you're not worthy any of that. And so, what it does is it stops our people from thinking they can be truthful and honest about what Scripture teaches, because Scripture is not part of the woke culture, right? At what we believe as Christians. Um, we believe that some people are going to die and go to hell because they don't know Jesus. We believe that. Um, and that's what drives what we do. That's what gives us the urgency to do what we do. But the woke culture says, well, that cannot be right. That just cannot be right. And so you are now bigoted or whatever other words they want to use to talk about Christians who speak the truth. And so what happens is people are afraid. They're afraid to respond to a Facebook post, right? So I think it's brought in just, just an overwhelming lot of fear into the church. They're afraid to respond to a Facebook post because who might I offend? Scripture says that the word is offensive. And we need to understand that the, the story of Jesus, the story of the cross is offensive. I think people are afraid to lose friends and lose family. They're afraid to be seen as intolerant, um, which in actuality, Christianity is the most intolerant faith tradition out there. If we believe what we really say, we believe. So I think the number one thing that the woke culture has done is put us in a state of fear. Um, well said, uh, JT. Yeah, you know, I think uh, I agree with that. The, you said you asked what, what's happened in the church as a result mm -hmm. of this. I think it's divided us philosophically. Mm -hmm. I think we're having to deal with philosophy of life, and, and which leads to this conversation of theology, ultimately the idea of absolute or relative truth. And, you know, does truth reside in you or does truth reside in something other than us? And therefore, if truth resides in you, your identity is based on your own truth. And if people disagree with you, it, it harms your own identity. That's why you can't disagree with me. That's why you can't push back against me. You know, and Bill, if you were a relativist, you could have said, well, that's my truth. You don't have any right to push back against me. Mm -hmm. I can talk about Caitlyn Jenner if I want to. Right. And that that that's a that's a spiral that leads us down really, really quick. And so I think the idea of of this idea of tolerance can actually be a positive thing, uh, because tolerance, by definition, means I don't agree with you. I'm tolerating you. I don't agree with your position, but I'm willing to have a conversation with you. And that speaks into scripture on how we are to engage a lost world with gentleness and with respect, but speaking the truth in love. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if we can do that, then we start getting into deeper conversations. We really see where people are spiritually. And so I think the idea of the woke culture being a blaming culture, which is what it is, right, needs to be rerouted into healthy conversations where everybody has the right then to be able to speak into one another's life. And it's going to end up on what's your foundation of truth. And and then we can speak the truth of God's word into their lives. Well, I think that uh, going back to where the, the program began today about disagreement and how that can go from order to chaos, uh, essentially the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States is about the freedom of religion and the freedom of speech. And the freedom of speech means that all speech is protected, especially the heinous, the, the terrible speech, the worst speech, the speech that makes you want to just regurgitate. And yet, without protecting that, nothing is protected. And so big tech has been doing a lot of censorship. And so I think it's the difference between equality of opportunity and equality of result. And the only way you can get equality of result is tyranny. 
and there are not, not not enough jails in America to put people into to get equality of result. It's equality of opportunity. And we're an imperfect nation, but we're the best nation. And so let's just stop there and take another break. And we'll come back. And what we're going to be talking about in the few minutes we have left, essentially, is uh, what are we as truth tellers and as Christians going to do in 2021? Uh, how are we going to show up in the culture? So let's learn more about how you can subscribe to the podcast and tell all your friends. And so we'll have millions of people writing in, wanting to know the great wisdom of this program. I humbly submit to you. All right, uh, let's take a break. If you want to expand the disciple-making movement, then share the show with your friends and colleagues. Hey, it's easy to subscribe. Simply go to iTunes or to our website, thebonhoefferproject.com, then click on The Bonhoeffer Show. Once you do, we will keep you updated with The Bonhoeffer Project's events, new materials and books, as well as the larger disciple-making movement current news. You can also access previous programs. And be sure to read Bill's weekly column, which is posted on the website. Remember, ask questions. Bill's answers are guaranteed to give you herd immunity, increase your IQ, and cause you to experience waves of euphoria. Well, not really, but his answers are really good. And now, let's get back to the Bonhoeffer Show. Welcome back. Uh, uh, Power Pack program today. Uh, what do Christian truth tellers face in 2021? How do we engage? And uh, Jesus taught us that telling the truth is hard, and it's never been harder than it is right now. It's how you tell it, I suppose, that's going to be a big part of it, but uh, we must make different disciples in this difficult age. We are called to tell the truth to those around us. Some of us have a large megaphone and are positioned to speak directly into the ruling class and the elite, but most of us uh, just have friends and associates and neighbors. So essentially, um, what is the way in which you guys think that we ought to be engaging the culture. You know, what is the what is what is the main focus that we can have? So uh, I'm gonna start with you, JT. Yeah, I think I think not a lot's changed between December 31st and January 1st. Um, I, th I think we continue to speak truth and love to people, uh, and and as a leader, that that is that we're more concerned with that and making disciples than we are people's opinions of us making disciples. And so the idea of being faithful to God's word and uh, whatever the fallout of that's going to be, because not a lot's changed in 2000 years, you know, as far as speaking truth goes, there's always been persecution of the truth uh, because people don't want to obey the truth. They don't want to submit and surrender to truth in Jesus. And so we're always going to face that. Jesus told us we would. But I think the faithfulness to watch your life and doctrine closely and to raise up disciples that don't only lean into culture, but speak in the culture um, is going to be critical moving forward because I can't be in the political. I'm not in the political realm. I'm not in the business realm. I'm in the church realm. Right. But I have a church full of people who have influence. And so if we can disciple them to be who God's called them to be as a follower of Jesus, to speak truth into different areas of culture, then this revolution really does take fire. Cindy. So I think uh, just like in Acts, like JT says, not a lot has changed in 2000 years. And in Acts, the truth um, uh, upended the power structure of those who did not follow the truth. And so we have to remember that that's what we're doing, right? We are upending the power structure because if we truly believe that God is sovereign, then you cannot be and I cannot be. Right. So so we got to look at it in that way first. But I think just as we watch Jesus make disciples. Right. It's it's a simple process. We love God. 
we love people. It's really that simple. And we watched Jesus build relationship with these guys that God put in his space. And he built that relationship. And then he taught them the things that he knew were right things. And then he sent them out to do the very same thing. And so I think that most important for us as believers and as leaders are our relationships. We must speak the truth in those relationships. I can't be afraid if I see you, Bill, doing something wacky and, and out of character, I can't be afraid that I'm going to offend you by saying that because I come to you in Christian love, right? So, so that's the, the, the idea that we have to take. We must speak truth in love into all situations. And it begins in the relationships right closest to us because they will model what they see us doing. And then they will go and do the same thing. Well, you guys have been great today. Thank you for co-hosting and uh, we'll have you for three more sessions and that's gonna be great for our listeners and for mm -hmm. our watchers uh, on the YouTube channel. So uh, as we always like to say, as we close, uh, follow Jesus and he'll teach you everything you'll ever need to know. Well, we hope that the show wasn't too bad. Jane Hull wants everyone to know that if anything Bill said was offensive, <laughs> she feels your pain. If you were upset by anything Bill and his guests said, well, <laughs> mission accomplished. At the Bonhoeffer Show, we value irreverent, satirical, and generally inappropriate behavior. But when it comes to fulfilling the Great Commission, we don't mess around. Remember, subscribe, we promise. No private jets, no white suits, and definitely no toupees.